All right. Uh, I guess we should kick it off with uh, the most obvious one. Where did you get the inspiration for this twisted uh, so film? James. Yeah, James. <laughs> <laughs> James. James. Uh, James. Right there. James. That's 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 right there. Have you got James? Are you coming? Are you coming down here? Come on, James. Come on. Come on. Yeah. 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 You wrote yeah. this thing, right? <laughs> I think you should be here. Don't be shy. I think this audience will enjoy what we just went through, right? <laughs> so go on, tell us about some of the inspirations. Oh, it's a lot for us. Go on. Um, we see serial killers a lot, right? And uh, sometimes they're fun and sometimes they're happy, and that's weird. Okay. And um, <laughs> so I wanted to show something very grim, so grim that it, it puts you into another place, kind of immediate. I think the voice started. I was taking very long bus rides and getting very grumpy, and the way I would exercise that is I had a little memo pad and I would write these horrible little poems that I would throw away, and I'd be like, I should keep these. <laughs> and it became this character, and it became all about power and, and domestic abuse, and men and women, and, and uh, authoritarian governments, and just, just how messy can we make? I think this audience liked how messy you made it, right? Did we like the script? Fantastic. Um, Let's talk a little bit, uh, we're going to throw it to you guys in a moment, so start thinking of some great questions. Um, obviously, I, I want to talk about your fantastic cast and the casting process. Uh, do you want to tell us uh, how you got them involved? Or maybe they can tell their stories. Yeah, I'll pass absolutely. it down. Yeah, I'll pass it down. Uh, Ashley Hallahan of uh, Hallahan Casting, cast of film. And, uh, great. Ashley is an awesome friend of mine. And she's here as well. And uh, Ashley cast uh, the last few projects that I've done that to me, and obviously right. it's a natural sort of... Uh, uh, Inclination for me to get Ashley to come cast in it because she's always done a great job. So, yeah, I'll pass it on to uh, Laura. Yeah, I'm going to like to get involved with this project. <laughs> Come on, Laura. Fine. By the way, let's give a big round of applause to the star of the world. Agnes, you are amazing. I, I hear you're very nice to in real life, but nothing like as scary as your character. So no, no. That's well, that's my boyfriend. He's nice. Okay. <laughs> Tell us about getting involved in this project. Uh, <laughs> yes, I mean, I got the script down as any, any audition, um, an old audition actor in my position would. Um, but when I first read the script, I weirdly connected it, connected with it, um, not in the way of killing people, uh, <laughs> just more so that I just, I really just appreciated how ballsy this woman is. Like, she just doesn't give a you know what? <laughs> and so reading through it, I'm like, you know, I, I really want this. And so I really, really did my homework um, for the first audition phase. It's probably the most work I've ever done for an audition in my life because I just knew I wanted it. And uh, luckily got the call back and um, went even further with the call back and did chemistry read uh, with these two lovely gentlemen here. And uh, and that was it. And I was lucky enough to get cast and I was thrilled. It was fantastic. I think everybody agrees on that, right? <laughs> uh, let's pass it on. To your co-star in crime, can you say? Yeah. Uh, tell us what it was like to get the role of uh, Mike Robert. Uh, yeah, Mike playing Mike is, uh, is uh, as you can see, a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, no, I, I approached it in the way of I really didn't want to do a lot of research. I wanted to be kind of surprised and knocked on my ass by this by this role. Um, that was kind of I felt important to the character and important to. Because uh, they're sort of in the in the same seat as the audience, uh, as far as Mike goes. Because you're like, well, what's going to happen next? Um, funnily enough, though, almost didn't make a callback because I was on set for a commercial for Belvedere cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks to them for letting me go early and, uh, and I made a callback. So yeah. A little bird tells me that you your background is only comedic uh, acting. A little bit, yeah, yeah. I have so a, mostly a, a theater drama. background, okay. so then. You know, now you're gonna get the shit kicked out of you for two hours, so how about that? <laughs> Something a little different. Yeah, a little different. A little different. Do you guys want to talk about uh, how you got involved? Like, if you just pass it down, everyone just talks about their involvement. No? Uh, same thing, got called in uh, to audition. Right. Navin and I have known each other a few years, and we've been talking about working together for a while. Yeah. And uh, so, when I got a chance and I found out that there was going to be a bath scene with Robert, I am so And I, I feel bad. They cut out half an hour of that for you. <laughs> it was the Unchained Melody. Um, but anyway, uh, no, it came in. How about Blu-ray uh, Extra, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Extra, totally. yeah. Ultra Blue. <laughs> Actually, the interesting, interesting story about, about uh, no, 
uh, world's characters will actually read initially for uh, for your character. Mine? And, uh, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, for Rob for Robert's character, and um, and and I just I just wanted you to read for Chris's character. Yeah. So we literally gave him the size. At the audience. Look at me and said, pathetic. He looks pathetic. We're <laughs> <laughs> like, hey man, you know what? Just keep this. Yeah. Go out there for the half an hour, whatever, come back and do for this other character and, and we'll see how it works out. Yeah. And um, and yeah, and then he got the part of, of, of Chris because that's that's interesting because yeah, things like that happen, you know. Sometimes yeah. Sam comes in and we throw another part and then you you you, you just kinda of see something in them and you're like, how about this other thing? Right? And it worked out perfectly. Because I think for me I think Will is such um, the Chris character in Poor Agnes is such a pivotal character, but it's also so underrated because it just kind of comes in so organically and so naturally. And a lot of the, I think, the dark humor and the, the relief that you get as an audience comes from the Chris character, you know? And yeah, I I just like that he never, he never gave in. I was like, it was kind of, well, I mean, it was interesting. Like when I was sort of trying to figure out the character in my mind, it was like, okay, your character gave in, was there Which, longer? Well, well, it was like your character's like a strong guy. Like, I put it you know, in time. And then, and then mine was just like you know, there was never a moment I think for Chris where he just wanted out of this. He was there was never, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm just so in love with it. You're just so naive and just you so think so? Clueless. All right. Anyway, do you guys want to just yeah, yeah. Just chime in on their involvement? Uh, I am Bruce Harper. I'm the cinematographer. Um, <laughs> Uh, now and I've worked together quite a few times. This is our third feature. Yeah. Um, uh, our, our second feature was called Chasing Valentine. It still is. It's on Blu-ray. Uh, <laughs> but Ryan came to this. Ryan is our uh, producer. Uh, and uh, he came to our screen. Uh, he saw the movie. Uh, he had me with me. He said it looked great. It, you know, it was well made. Uh, here's a script. Do you think Navin would like to do it? And it was the first time I ever got Navin a job. <laughs> and that's true. Um, very early on, James had sent me the script and he said, you know, I think I've got something here. And I read it and I said, holy shit, I think you do. Who is going to play Agnes? Um, and I called the executive producer, John Luca, and he was like, wow, this is an amazing film. Um, really, how the hell are we going to find Agnes? And we were kind of blown away when, when Laura came in. I mean, there, there was no second choice, literally. We were just like, okay, wow, auditions are over. Um, and then as we were crewing this up, um, I'd worked with Bruce before, and I called Bruce and I said, listen, we really want to have like a very polished look to this film, you know, I think you, you bring a lot to it. And I saw your work with Nava, and I said, wow, I think as a team, you guys have this really, really strong visual style. And then right from the beginning, you know, those conversations started. And, you know, James was very involved in the process as the creative producer as well, so I think it was a really interesting synergy. And then AJ got into the process at the script stage, and we spent a lot of time you know, developing this together as a team, and then as Laura came on with the character, and it just had this really you know, organic build. And of course, we took everybody up to Thunder Bay where they couldn't escape, and we had them for several weeks. So there was really nothing to do but just make this film, and I think a lot of that really comes out in the rawness of the final product. Hey, I'm Stephanie Avery, I'm the production designer. Um, I, I've worked with and been friends with Ryan and James and Bruce for many years now and uh, when Ryan approached me about working on this feature I was like absolutely even when he very cautiously was like what about Thunder Bay in October like, it just, immediately I was like yes absolutely I want to do this I want to work with this team I want to work with these people and being in Thunder Bay was such a gift it was almost as though all the sets we work on were characters in and of themselves, and we couldn't have done that, I think, anywhere else. It was, it was an amazing experience. Hi, I'm Megan Fraser. I did makeup and special effects. Uh, this was, uh, it was a great experience. I had worked with AJ previously on a uh, horror feature, and literally she texted me one day going, you know how to make fake arms, right? And I said, yes and that's how I got the job. Um, but overall, I honestly, I had no idea what I was gonna get into. I read the script, I went, this is so weird. Great, it was challenging, we all lived, like literally we lived together for two weeks, and like, usually you would hate everybody, but like we still chat every day, and I love all of them to death, and it was just overall a great experience. It's so great to see everyone enjoy it as much as we enjoy making it. So, yeah, yeah, guys. <laughs> I'm Sydney Kelper, I'm the editor. Um, I got a call 
from AJ, uh, <laughs> basically saying, hey, can you cut a film in five days, please? <laughs> At which point I laughed and said yes for some reason. Um, somehow cut a two-hour rough cut in five days and some sound. Uh, I don't know how I did it. I don't think I'll ever be able to do that again. But I fell in love with the story. I just loved the characters so much. It was so interesting to me that when they asked me to continue editing, I said yes, because it was just such a fun, fun experience. I knew it was just going to be super rewarding, which it was, and I learned a lot. And this is Dina. <laughs> Hi, uh, Deanne Churchino, costume designer. Uh, I too was approached by AJ for this project, and uh, it was, she said, serial killer messed up, and I said yes right away, because that to me is fun. And that, that's pretty much it. I read the script, and I thought this is crazy and weird, and I love it. And uh, so I hopped on board, because as you, I hope you think, it's a great project, and it was a lot of fun to make. And, Unfortunately, I didn't make it to Thunder Bay, but um, Megan did justice with helping out with wardrobe. Um, and yeah, that, that's it for me. Loved it. Hi. Uh, I'm AJ. <laughs> with, like, sadly, the exception of Sydney and Deanna, who didn't come with us, but, and Dan Glegg, actually, who's not here, but this was the team that made Poor Agnes. There were 11 of us that went from Toronto to Thunder Bay. We did a 96-page script in 12 days in a city that only James and Ryan knew, and we ended up going um, because, and this was a, like, put my foot in my mouth day. We were checking out Hamilton as a location, and I was like, I mean, like, Thunder Bay just, Sounds so cool, like why not just film there? And Ryan was like, you know what? That's a great idea. <laughs> and then like a month later, we're like, well, 16 hours in the car. <laughs> um, this is the beauty of independent filmmaking. You get to put together a team you work with over and over and over again. Everyone you're looking at, I've worked with almost more than once and I continue to bring out because in indie filmmaking, you need to love the people you're around and trust that if Deanna can't make it to Thunder Bay, Megan can make sure that, you know, Laura's wearing the right red plaid to kill Chris. And, you know, Navin and I and Bruce spent hours sitting in front of a computer to make the schedule work, and Ryan and I sat in Thunder Bay begging and pleading and smiling at people to let us use their spaces, and we're very proud of how it turned out because, honestly, it's half magic and half love for the people you surround yourself with, so I'm really pleased we got to show it here in Toronto. You know, everyone here, this is... This is my church, these are my people, and we're so pleased to have had everyone see it. Can we come up to the floor? Do you have some questions? If anyone far one out, raise a hand. Or should I keep warming things up? Anybody got a question right now? Anybody want one on that top of mind? <laughs> see any hands? It's really hard with the bright book. Go for it. The bat scene where she was trying to take his hands off. The it won't fit line, was that in the script, Rob? Oh, you better believe it. The, 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 question, the question was about the it won't fit line. Contrary to popular belief, it won't fit. <laughs> oh, that's, that's cool, I think we covered it. Uh, yes, was in the script. That was actually written by James Gordon Ross. <laughs> we got any more questions? Over there, go. Uh, did Mike ever consider giving Agnes the business card for the media scent clothing, and how would she have reacted? So did you, everyone hear that? The question about the, the business card, did Mike ever consider giving it to Agnes? But I have given you the, the card that, that Kate, who I don't think is here, unfortunately, our lovely Australian film student, uh, would I have given that to you? <laughs> Thoughts? I don't know. What? <laughs> how, okay, how would you have reacted to it? I probably would have shoved it in your mouth and gone with it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you got some more? Anybody just shut, go for it. If someone was going to embark on a similar movie making <laughs> process, do you have any advice that you would give them on making a similar 
feature in such a short amount of time. The question was about would you, what advice would you give someone to do a similar project? And so we're now yeah. trying. Um, <laughs> um, surround you. yourself <laughs> with people that will fill every role you need them to fill. And if you are working with very little, make sure that you don't go over budget because it will hurt. But also, really, it's about the people you bring on set and the energy you put into it. And you will be so much prouder of the work that you have at the end of it if you can look around and say, each of us put 150% into what we did, and this is you know, the product that we had in a labor of love. I definitely, definitely have a good blueprint, though. Have a, make sure your script is ready to go. A lot of, um, I, I read a lot of scripts, and I, I watch a lot of films, and a lot of issues I find is, People go to camera too soon. So take your time with the screenplay, make sure your screenplay is solid, have a good blueprint before you go into production, and then everything else that ages it. Over there? Uh, when can we expect the sequel? When can we expect the sequel? <laughs> Who'd like a sequel to Paramus? <laughs> All right. Reminded us that, however, I'll plug our little. Uh, we, we we are getting a little theatrical release. So if you yeah. like the movie, and um, you know you have, you have friends who couldn't make it to the screen today, please let them know that Poor Agnes is going to be playing at the Carlton Cinema starting November 10th. So please bring everyone out. We need to sell all of those seats as well. Uh, if we can sell that we to Carlton, maybe we'll talk about a sequel. <laughs> there you go. James, James Gordon. You mentioned authoritarian government as a part of the inspiration. Can you elaborate on that, please? The process of brainwashing that um, Agnes applies to Mike comes from us, from our good friends at the CIA, <laughs> who uh, put out a torture manual in the 1960s. And she goes through the steps. And I think uh, the film, the attraction between Mike and Agnes represents I think a, f a flaw in the human species, really, that, that we're attracted to dangerous personalities. Uh, whether it's Mussolini or Hitler or other strongman narcissists who might be in power of government somewhere in the world right now, I think we like the bullies. We like the, the cruel people. There's something about it that, that catches into us. And uh, I hope I showed that. And these guys helped a lot. <laughs> Yeah, over there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, just for the writer as well. What was your uh, decision behind making her Agnes a character of fate? The question is, uh, what was the decision-making process for making Agnes a person of faith? Yes. Why she talks about God so much? Why this? Uh, it comes to me from Hitler, really. I, there's a lot of talk about Hitler where um, sometimes uh, people accuse. Catholics of having some association with Hitler because he was raised Catholic, and I uh, agree with that. And people say, "Oh, he left religion, and he he wasn't he was atheistic." And I don't think that's fair to people who don't have a faith. And and he sort of had the worst of both worlds. And it was so ugly that I just had to put it in there because it just it gives it such a creepy feel that she feels that he's just smiling down on her while he, she does these awful, awful things. How long did it take me to write the script from stop from start to finish? Uh, the initial those those voiceovers those those creepy words that come in they came first. I had those for a while and just sat on them for about six months before the vague plot came in. And then it was you know we were looking for funding, we were building it. I was showing it to Ryan, I was showing it to John, I was showing it to other people I know, and people had suggestions and stuff. And so the whole process we were rewriting while we were shooting. And, and sometimes that was for production problems, and sometimes that was just inspiration of things. We were using the space where the, the actors had ideas, everybody was, was building. It really helps to have a small team where you can do stuff like that. And so I would say it was probably two and a half years of 
just slowly putting things together. The basic frame came pretty quickly. That, that was in about three months of work, but about two and a half years. Actually, I've got a question for your cast, because obviously you guys go to some very, very dark places with these characters. Um, what was that like to go where you guys had to go, and then how would you decompress uh, at night? Uh, especially, <laughs> I guess, I mean, oh boy. do you want to talk about that? Oh boy. This was right in the throes of Pineapple Pen. <laughs> and that was, that really kept us going on those hard days. No, uh, we kind of, we would shoot on the set shop. We would shoot on the set, and then we would just, I mean, uh, as far as Laura and I and a few others, we had to come back to the, the crew house where we would sleep. So it was kind of like we were never away from each other. Uh, you just have to... He was chained up. I was chained up there too, yeah. Yeah, all Daniel day lives with it. Um, no, it was just, uh, it, it was kind of just making the best of it. Uh, because we couldn't really go anywhere else. It was just like, I wake up and I see you, and I go to work and I see you, and I go home and guess what, I see you. You loved it. <laughs> I'm still in the dark place. <laughs> ah! I forgot the question. What was the question? How did um, you... Children's falling down. Yeah, we, we, we spent a lot of time watching Reddit videos of children falling over. <laughs> it was, you, you know, we'd get home from set, it was a long day, everyone's tired, and, you know, it's Two o'clock in the morning, everyone's tired. We'd all sit in the kitchen, open a bottle of wine, and watch videos of children falling over. And that took us away from the dark places, and, uh, and then we were ready to go for the next day. <laughs> I, I just watched the American election. That's all I did to relax. You know? I'm not kidding, actually. It kept me in the frame of mind that I was being tortured. So we've just got time for, just got time for uh, maybe just a couple more, because we are, Cineplex is about to. So the center staff home. <laughs> All right, um, I'll go you, and then you at the back. Six, seven, nine. Okay, and, um, my question is, um, was it um, always your intention to keep what exactly happened at the mental hospital at the end ambiguous? Because it, the film hints that Agnes did something at the hospital does not show it. Was it? So the question is about that ending. Was it always the plan to keep it slightly ambiguous whether or not Agnes has shown up? Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I think the ending is very fitting for the movie, and that was how it was written, and that's how we shot it. I, I, it there was really no really discussion about it, because that was completely appropriate for it. And it is completely open-ended. I think, I think it co could go either way, because um, Mike's character was so broken down and so tortured and so haunted by the Agnes character that it could all be in his head, but at the same time, she did break down and could have actually been her. So, yes, it was always left to be uh, pretty ambiguous. Yeah? Okay. Um, just a quick question. Uh, was Poor Agnes the original title, and why did you decide on Poor Agnes? Yes, it was, and I'll turn it to James for the explanation. Um, I get to hear interpretations of people telling me what the, the title means, and I really like that. Um, originally, when I wrote it, um, Poor Agnes, uh, it meant that she was poor of spirit that she was, she was a driven, talented, intelligent person who should be you know, out there doing wonderful things in the world, but she was just missing this one little, little piece of humanity, that, that empathy that drives the rest of us, and with that one tiny thing missing, she becomes so poor. And, but I've also heard um, that it's, it's poor me, that, that she, can, she can draw you in, even though she's doing these terrible things, you, you feel that Oh, Agnes wasn't entertained by killing that person. And why? Why am I feeling bad about that? And she has this this power. And you can have more philosophical discussions about <laughs> Agnes at the office pub, third floor, which is where we're going to celebrate with this wonderful casting crew. Agnes, give it up. And we'll see you after the office. Two more